And welcome back. As you as you read from the inter interlude, our next presenter will be Dr. Philip Gut from Nestle Research. And Philip is here cell as the head of the cell biology department at Nestle Research, and he will be talking about how you can go from innovative tools to natural product discoveries and how to translate this into humans. So without further hesitation, I would like to invite Philip to the stage. Hello, Christopher. Hey, this is Philip. Hi, Philip. Hello. Hello, how are you? Doing well. Good, good. So, busy schedule today, and we're all very excited for your talk, and um, I hope you're ex as excited as we are. So I no, see you I'm have prepared. Sure. It's, it's a great event, uh, Christopher. I, you know, I'm really impressed, and you know, although being maybe a little bit more advanced in my career than many here, I, I, I learned so much so far. So it's, it's, a, it's a really, you know, both technically and then also what the presenters uh, you know, highlighted today. I think it's, it was a really cool event so far. Yeah, thank thank you. Of course, without you, uh, this event wouldn't take place. So we're very grateful for having you here today. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to your presentation. So and the slides are now on the screen. So without perfect. any perfect further end. hesitation. Perfect. So yeah, thank you, Christopher. Thanks for a nice introduction. Uh, welcome to everyone who's joining the session. Um, so what I will uh, share with you today is a bit my journey from medical school to academia, where I studied quite you know, advanced, uh, you know, specific research tools, and then how I moved to, to Nestle and how I apply the tools and, and some others um, to facilitate human translation. So it's not a very uh, linear career path that I took as, as uh, you know, starting from medical school. Um, but, uh, it, uh, you know, personally, I think it, it was a, so far, it's a really exciting career path. And, you know, like Garrett said at the beginning, what works for me may not work for everyone, but let, let me share my path. And, and, you know, I'm looking forward to, to your questions um, later on. So I, I um, always had a dual interest in medicine and uh, and uh, academic research and in research in general. So I studied uh, medicine in in Heidelberg in Germany. I, I was actually born in Heidelberg. Um, it's a, it's a really good uh, university, an old university. Uh, if you have ever been, so the medical campus is somewhere here behind the hill. Here's the old town. So if you have any any time in the future when traveling resumes the occasion to go to Heidelberg to a, a conference, I would encourage you to do so. It's a, it's a really nice city to visit. Then my steps towards research actually started before going to medical school. So um, in Germany at the time after high school, we had to do either military service or we could opt out and, and do social service. Uh, in, in my case, I, I thought that is a great occasion to learn something about research. Uh, I had you know, no, no family members in research, so I, I kind of liked the idea to do research, but I had very few insights. So I, I joined the German Cancer Research Center, the DKFZ in Heidelberg uh, for uh, 12 months. Uh, I, I was able to join a group that was led by Peter Krammer. He was a very famous uh, cancer researcher at the time, one of the most cited uh, cancer researchers worldwide. And it was a gigantic lab, it was about uh, 50 or 60 people. And uh, I, I didn't do any research. I was just uh, doing the lab management, helping the researchers to prepare media, to, to you know, order stuff and so on. Um, but it was just very impressive to see such a huge research operation going. And I think what was even more important is that the lab uh, had um, was roughly split half-half in biologists and, and medical doctors that were working uh, either on, on the MD, PhD program uh, or on, on their postdoc. And um, so for me, it was a good way to talk to them and kind of get an idea whether I would rather go to study biology or, or medicine. And so most of them told me, just do economics, do economics. It's the right thing to do. Um, you know, I, I still very much like the idea of doing research. I liked medicine, so I, I still applied um, in the end to medical school, mainly because uh, I thought medicine gives me more option in, in, in the end. So I, I, I started medical school. And then at the time, we had the possibility to do our medical thesis, which is kind of a short version of a PhD in parallel to, to the uh, normal curriculum. So I, you know, after two years of, of medical studies, I, I joined the lab of uh, the Institute of Neuroanatomy of Professor Klaus Unziker. I started something very fundamental, uh, neural crest development and, and how this developmental lineage uh, gives rise to the um, adrenal gland. So it was very fundamental, but 
it was just a very exciting research program. I, again, I like being in the lab. Uh, I, I like this idea of, of working on projects. And um, so after the, the completion of the thesis, I, I continued uh, medical school. I, I did a, a few um, uh, stints uh, abroad. I was uh, one year in, in Spain and I did some of my last year medical training in France in Strasbourg. And and then afterwards, I, I was very much split between whether I should do residency first uh, uh, and do research in parallel, or if I wanted to first do, uh, uh, you know, research a postdoc essentially. And so my supervisor Klaus Unzicker, he he very much encouraged me to take, uh, you know, full time to try to get a fellowship, take take full time uh, focus on on research. Uh, just because it's um, this is how you build the basis before you try to do research in, in parallel to medicine. And, you know, uh, he gave me another very good advice. And, and this was, if you want to do research, try to figure out what's, what's the topics that you're interested in, and then try to get into the best lab in the world in this space. Because in the end, these labs are the ones that provide you the environment to do really state-of-the-art research. Um, and in the end, you, you put the same energy in, but you just have a whole different set of opportunities. And that was a very good advice because I think intuitively, of course, we want to go rather in smaller steps. Um, so so I think, you know, take the courage. If, if you want to do academic research, try to get into, into the best lab you can in your area. Uh, I think the, th the second thing that I I would advise at this point, I think there are very few areas, work areas, where it's so easy to to uh, to get into internships. In, in research, uh, especially academic research, you can almost literally walk into labs when you're a student and, and ask questions, what are you doing, uh, and, and uh, do short or longer term research stays. So I don't show everything here, but I did quite a few uh, like short term experience in different labs just to try to understand uh, better how, how research functions. And so uh, with this background, I applied um, to labs, in, uh, to three labs essentially, in, in, one in Boston, one in San Diego, and one in San Francisco. The, the way I chose them was that I wanted to put a strong focus on state-of-the-art technology. So two of the labs were organoid, or at the time it was uh, uh, stem cell labs. Uh, today it has evolved into organoids, but uh, the, you know, it was the beginning of induced pluripotent stem cells. And the other lab was uh, a lab in San Francisco that I eventually joined uh, of Didier Steinier, uh, where the main technology are seprafish. And, and I will uh, explain in a, in a minute uh, what attracted me to this lab. So uh, Didier's lab uh, is uh, built on this little vertebrate. It's about a three centimeter long long fish called the seprafish. And uh, Didier was one of the pioneers of, of the modern seprafish research. So what he, uh, started uh, um, along with a few others is a technology called forward genetics. So essentially, you generate uh, hundreds uh, and thousands of separa fish, and you introduce in the in the parents random genetic mutations, and then uh, you can screen essentially the progeny and try to find uh, separa fish lines with. Uh, with malformations of different organs. And then you can trace back the gene. And, and this allows you to, to dissect in a very systematic way organ development. So this is something that was previously not possible in the vertebrate. Um, and, and I thought like this quick way of working with seprafish compared to mice was something where I saw a lot of potential. So I applied to, to DD's lab uh, with the idea of uh, you know using the, the rapid throughput of seprafish not to look into organ development, but to look into physiology. Uh, and this came then to the idea uh, that, you know, some some labs in, in Boston had started at the time that uh, seprafish are a fantastic system for drug discovery because seprafish larvae are small, they're about three millimeters. You can generate thousands of them very easily and you can place them in 96 well plates. Uh, and then because they're already in an aqueous medium, you can just add the drugs to the wells and you can observe uh, the phenotypes in response to the drugs. And, and so what I, what I, I did, and this worked uh, rather well, is that uh, here you see uh, a separate fish with a reporter line in the liver that you see getting stronger here that indicates with green fluorescence uh, on the second line that I generate with bioluminescence uh, to what extent the liver is in a fasting mode in which to what extent the liver is, is starting to produce glucose. 
And and so when the fish then deplete their, their yolk nutrients, so this is the yolk where the energy comes from, and if you don't feed them, they start this fasting program. And, and this was kind of the, the principle to screen then thousands of of drugs, of bioactives to see if we can find uh, what we call fasting mimetics. And fasting mimetics at the time was a hot topic um, because there was a lot of research uh, in, in the aging uh, research space that was coming up about caloric restriction and the effects on, on health. And so maybe one of my luckiest career moves in a way uh, was that you know when when I had identified interesting hits from the fish screen, uh, I was able to um, to uh, work in the lab of Eric Verdeen in parallel, uh, where I could get access to to you know, expertise in mitochondria research and in mouse research to see what the health benefits of these fasting mimetics were, and. And uh, during this time, uh, Didier Stanier, uh, my mentor, he got an offer from the Max Planck Institute in Germany, and he moved to Germany and, and offered me to come along. Uh, at the time, that was very difficult for, for uh, personal reasons. My, my wife is a, is a lawyer, and she had just obtained the, the bar exam. In, in San Francisco and, and uh, she's from France. So she said, you know, two bar exams are enough. We're not moving to Germany. Um, but this turned out really luckily for me because um, Eric Verdeen asked me, okay, so if you want to stay in San Francisco, just uh, come to my lab, finish your postdoc here, help me supervise students. And, and with this, I got really into, let's say, the, the research topic that, uh, you know, follows me and that I'm following actively until today at Nestle. And, and this is what you know I call the aging research revolution. So um, at the time, uh, you know, a few years before I, I came to San Francisco, uh, labs, including the lab of, of Cynthia Canyon, they, they pioneered the use of lower organisms like the, uh, the roundworm C. elegans to study lifespan. Um, and so this may be one of the most famous scientific articles in the space where, where Cynthia could show if you knock out one single gene in the C. elegans, uh, which is the, the carbohydrate, uh, you know, the carbohydrate sensing pathway of the worm, you get worms that live twice as long as a normal worm. So this essentially showed in an extreme case to what extent uh, lifespan can be modified. And this has led to, to really an exploding field of aging research, where eventually from genetic manipulations, many groups went into um, identifying small molecules that uh, very robustly modify lifespan and ultimately health span. So this, uh, you know, of course, we it's not about just living long, but to what extent an organism maintains full, full body functions and health. And, and you can already see here that, you know, uh, besides metformin, rapamycin, there are drugs, resveratrol and nicotinoid riboside are, are natural uh, uh, bioactives. And so this field of identifying small molecules that uh, consistently have a positive impact on health span, lifespan, uh, was picked up by, by Bloomberg at the time by uh, Bloomberg Business Week uh, in response to Novartis announcing going after uh, anti-aging drugs with rapamycin. Uh, but but more importantly, also being at San Francisco in the heart of Silicon Valley, uh, at the time there were a lot of um, venture capitalist firms that identified aging research as a, as a very hot uh, innovative topic and these companies are quite uh, uh, trigger friendly to giving investment for for creating an ecosystem of companies and today it's a whole you know the aging research the longevity sector is, is considered a, a, a new industry sector so why is this important why I, do i uh, truly believe in this um, so you know and these you know at least to me these numbers are a bit shocking so today we we are in a, what we call a reactive healthcare system. And we also know that the costs are unsustainable. So why is that? So we, we are in an, in an aging demographic setting where we have more and more uh, people above 60, less and less kids below 50. So we have actually more seniors today than children under five. Um, and if you look into the US, 90% uh, of every dollar that's spent from, from the healthcare sector goes into treating people that have at least one disease. So that's like $3.4 trillion. And you know now, of course, this is comparing apples and oranges, but this is roughly twice the amount that people spend on on food, including the food in uh, service sector. So to me, this is is quite shocking. Now, if if you look at this from a perspective of of medicine, so the the, the medical system you can divide in three pillars. One is primary prevention, 
secondary prevention and tertiary prevention. Primary prevention is everything is essentially everything you do when you're young and you want to stay healthy that you do to prevent getting sick uh, later, like doing exercise and, and eating well. Secondary prevention is if there's a, a chronic condition that is identified, let's say hypertension, and you start treating the hypertension. And tertiary prevention is like once, let's say, a patient had a myocardial infarct, uh, then every, you know, all the everything that has been done to prevent a, a second uh, incidence. And so what personally I, I find crazy is, you know, that essentially today we wait until there's a problem, then we go see our doctor and the doctor tells us, take this drug twice a day in brackets for the rest of your life. And what is being done early on in terms of primary prevention is, is very vague even today. So you get the recommendation to do more sports, eat healthy. And, and for example, in six years medical school, there was only one single week on, on nutrition. Uh, and this knowing that uh, poor nutrition has been identified as the main risk factor for disease and mortality. So essentially what, what drives me in terms of the purpose is that I truly believe that we need to do more to elevate the role of healthy nutrition and, and not drugs for proactive health management. And specifically the, the area that I'm excited about, I'm working on is the question, can we, can we make targeted nutrition? Essentially nutrition that builds on all the progress in aging research um, to, to have more tools to give to people to prevent disease and extend healthy years of life. Now, how was my transition to industry? So in uh, 2014, I, I um, joined Nestle as a, as a team leader. Um, there was um, partially a career move and partially a move that at the time as a family, we decided that we wanted to move back to Europe. And, and Geneva was just a very good uh, look at Geneva, Lausanne area was a very good location for us. Um, but it was also a great opportunity. So at the time I, I you know, I got hired to introduce the Sepra fish technology to Nestle research. Um, then the next milestone for me that, uh, you know, after the facility was installed, I, I helped build a program in healthy aging and, and uh, mitochondrial research, essentially based on these these concepts that I introduced to you earlier that, you know, healthy aging can be modified. Um, and, and so I got uh, more responsibility. And then in 2018, um, the Nestle Institute of Health Science at the time, which was a separate research entity of Nestle, got merged with Nestle Research and Development. And so I had the privilege then to take over the cell biology department uh, which is uh, a department that consists of three groups today, uh, has about uh, 30 uh, people working. Uh, and uh, I will explain in a, in a second what we're doing in the cell biology department. So I will not go into detail because Christoph gave a really nice presentation this morning about uh, Nestor research and development, uh, just to give you a bit an idea of how we operate. So. Uh, you know, we are in the cell biology department part of Nestle Research, uh, which is part of Nestle R&D. Uh, it's a large uh, research organization, about 4,000 employees, very international. Uh, you know, even at, at our institute, I think we have more than 40 nationalities. Um, and uh, we're uh, spread out over four continents and 22 R&D locations, which includes everything from research centers, um, to innovation hubs and uh, product technology centers. And so you can imagine a bit research and development, a bit like a, like a biotech company in, the, in, the, uh, e in an ecosystem of different companies uh, because the needs of the different Nestle businesses are quite different. So we work uh, a lot with Nestle Health Science, which has uh, consumer and patient care products. We also work uh, with our colleagues uh, in, at Nestle Pet Care for pet foods and veterinary diets. Uh, but even the, the general, let's say, Nestle food and beverages uh, companies like dairy or Nestle food uh, um, are sometimes quite interested in, in the type of projects we're doing. And then there's, of course, our Nestle nutrition businesses, which provides early life and maternal nutrition solutions, as Christoph uh, introduced earlier today. So what do we do in the cell biology department? Um, so we can cover the full pipeline from uh, uh, early discovery uh, to very early stage mechanistic human research. Um, so to our knowledge, we have the, the biggest uh, screening library of natural products in the food industry. So we have about 50,000 single ingredients, fractions and extracts um, that we either screen in a more traditional way 
um, or we use uh, molecular networking and untargeted metabolomics to identify uh, ingredients in fractions and extracts that are bioactive or uh, with an external collaborator we also do uh, a network biology approach like in silico discovery approaches of natural molecules then we try where we can to uh, uh, use innovative research tools like organoids or separafish for 3r and, and uh, to facilitate translation um, we also do where necessary a preclinical rodent research and uh, ultimately our goal from the perspective of my department is to bring uh, research into uh, early clinical uh, development so i'll give you just one example of, of what we do uh, and i really like this uh, this scheme I, I don't know who the author is it floats on linkedin and on, on google um, and i think it's really nice to illustrate how important mitochondria are so mitochondria are the organelles that give our cells the power the energy uh, for us from a nutrition perspective it's interesting because mitochondria they integrate the nutrients that we take in and convert them into energy and other uh, important function of mitochondria. But more importantly, we also know that mitochondria, they, they are getting damaged over time. So they're getting in a way used up um, with aging and, and uh, chronic diseases often put additional stress on mitochondria. And, and one of the uh, you know, important pathways to keep our mitochondria healthy is called autophagy. So it's a digestion of mitochondria and other cell materials um, to remove and replace damaged mitochondria. And um, so here I give you just one example how we approach this. So uh, back to the, you know, to, to, to the basics here. So this is the mitochondrion. Uh, this is a autophagosome. So once the cell identifies a mitochondrion is, is damaged, it gets engulfed um, and it gets sensed to a, a vacuole in mammalian cells. It's a, it's a vacuole for degradation acidic medium. Now, if you remember back to saprafish, what you can do is you can make fluorescent reporters. So you can take uh, the cargo particle LC31 of autophagosomes, make it green fluorescent, and then uh, visualize it when it gets docked, docked to the autophagosomes and then to the lysosome. So you can essentially visualize this physiological process. And this is what we, we did here. So this is a fish uh, with the muscle in, in green, uh, with the autophagosomes spread out mostly about, over the cytosol. And then when you stop this, the, the fusion of the lysosome with the, with, uh, with the autophagosome, you can start seeing these emerging dots, which are essentially what we want to see, the, the, the autophagy process. Now, how can we screen for this? So we, we like to use high content screening. Uh, so here again, this would be uh, animal without much autophagy going on. Uh, this is uh, the little dots here, you can see active autophagy. And, and the workflow is that we can generate hundreds of larvae. We can put them in a high content imager, do a quite complicated image processing and come down uh, to uh, hits like here in this case, it's a polyamine that induces autophagy. And uh, by adding uh, the lysosomal blocker, we can see uh, the additional increase, which indicates that there was true flux and not an inhibition of autophagy. Uh, so here is, is, is one example of what we discovered. So essentially, when you when you uh, flavor your pizza with, with thyme or oregano, you actually add an ingredient that is a very good autophagy inducer. It's called uh, thymol. Uh, you see here in uh, human cells that thymol induces autophagy, roughly halfway of the, uh, you know a condition that's very strong in inducing autophagy, which is fasting, when we mimic fasting in cells. And, and uh, so we could uh, take thymol forward in preclinical exploration. And, and so in a, in a model of premature aging, we, uh, uh, we increase the endurance of the mice. We also increase their exploration behavior. Um, and uh, in a, a model where we give a metabolic change a, a challenge, we reduce uh, fat accumulation in the liver. So we can, we can say that in this case, we have a molecule that works on the fundamental process in cells on autophagy with transversal benefits. Um, and, and here we, we are now being guided into where to go now as a, as a next step. So in, in parallel, what we did uh, over the last years uh, together with our colleagues from Nestle Health Science is we, we built a brand called Celtriant for target nutrition for older adults. That uh, is a brand that ha works with ingredients that work on these fundamental processes of aging in, in cells. And I will just highlight the screen one because uh, 
there will be a talk later by Penelope Antreau from uh, Amacentis Life Science. So in, in this case, uh, this was a collaboration with, with the company Amacentis here at EPFL. Um, so she will tell you much more. But for me, what was fascinating is to, to see kind of the complexity of going from like research concepts, uh, in this case, aging research, to having something on the shelf, uh, in this case, even with a new brand, and, and how many people are involved and, and how complicated the process is, uh, but also how important your own role as a scientist can be in, in communicating the concepts and, and helping uh, building the, the science and the way uh, the, the, we communicate on the science. Uh, so I will end. Uh, with uh, a few insights and considerations, a, a bit like um, things I observed in the past years, uh, especially uh, with with um, you know people applying, wanting to make the transition from academia to industry, and what a bit the pitfalls are, and, and uh, what I think is is uh, valuable to share with you. So if if you think uh, how we're being organized, so. Um, so I'm heading the cell biology department, and the cell biology department is an organizational structure. So we, you know, we have scientists, research assistants, technicians. We have experts, subject matter experts uh, in the department, like uh, Christoph explained earlier. And then there's, of course, uh, the department manager and, and the group leaders. So what we form is this organizational structure is a research unit with shared science and technology expertise. However, other to academia, where the group would be kind of the, the, let's say, the group that delivers on the output, on research, on publications, on grants, uh, modern organizations and the organizations are commonly organized in a matrix organization way. So where we have this organizational structure, we have a parallel structure, which is essentially the functional team that delivers on projects. And so why is this important? So to make translation happen, you need a real, truly interdisciplinary effort. So in a project team, <clears throat> you will have a project lead. So this can be in, sometimes me as a department head, but not necessarily. But then you also have an R&D manager from the business that is essentially responsible of <clears throat> communicating the, the, the science together with the team to the commercial colleagues. You have IP attorneys, um, you have project managers, and so on. <clears throat> Sorry. And, and so this is very important now if you um, to understand uh, if you apply to to an industry setting because often what we see is that uh, someone who has uh, finished a very successful broad, uh, postdoc and is in the academic mindset of course the next step is to lead a group to become an assistant professor so it's, it's of course it's very tempting to apply for group leader positions in it at Nestle or, or in other uh, organizations however as Christoph explained earlier today, Usually, the the people that are line managers that uh, that um, uh, lead and manage the organization structure, they have acquired quite a bit of expertise in um, how to develop people, how to develop talents, and also how to communicate to to major stakeholders. <coughs> and this is something that you don't commonly have. <coughs> Sorry, coming from. Um, uh, academia. So in reality, when you apply, um, often you want to look out for specialist positions, for positions where you can have the opportunity to bring yourself in as an expert, as a scientist, and uh, eventually have a big impact on a, on a matrix team. And, and here, in reality, if it's an important project, you may end up coordinating or managing more people than if you start as an assistant professor. So, but it's kind of an, an evolving process, uh, as Christoph said, based on, on how you deliver. But it's really for most of the people transitioning from postdoc to um, industry, kind of the entry point and not the group leader position, although obviously there are exceptions. So I think this is an important point that I wanted to make here. Uh, and the last point I wanted to make is, what we mean when we talk about translating research. So commonly we think of translation, you have a discovery early stage, you test it in cellular systems, maybe in, in preclinical models, and eventually it's being translated uh, to the clinic. Um, now, what is almost as important is that you translate your knowledge, your discoveries in a common language so that you can reach everyone in the organization that needs to be reached. So in, in, in my responsibility, 
I sometimes within the same day I have to communicate the project uh, to to true experts. Let's say an academic collaborator, an expert in the field, who is of course much more into the topic and much more um, uh, has a much higher expertise than I have. But I have to be credible. I have to communicate our goals the the, the right way. But at the same time, I have to be able to communicate to R and D stakeholders, which you know may be uh, by background a biologist, a medical doctor, but they're clearly not into the topic. So you have to communicate in a way that you convince them to to sponsor the project. So it's it's a different you know way of of communicating, very different way than communicating to an expert to get credibility. Uh, also, you may want to communicate to commercial colleagues, let's say a marketing colleague, to, to kind of explain the concepts between behind the complicated science. Uh, and uh, in, in uh, many occasions also, uh, I have to communicate to the really senior managers, which may even include the board of directors or the executive board. And, and of course, uh, although they're extremely smart people, of course, they're not scientists. So it's a whole different, and they have a helicopter view. So they're not necessarily, you know, uh, approaching what they want to get out of a presentation the same way as uh, a marketing colleague or an R&D stakeholder would be. And, and, and this is really like the, the breadth of audiences you have to communicate to is, is really critical uh, for an industry career. Now, there are you know, many, many ways to, to get better at, at communicating. You, you, know, you can also find a lot of uh, information how to do it on the internet. And, and I think especially in an early career, I would encourage you to, to really work on you know, what you can do to, to communicate your science in the best way. Uh, I think in the end, there, there are two principles that I try to visualize before even putting together the first slide of a presentation. So the first one is like, who's really the audience? And and how do I make my audience listen to me and, and and not look at their cell phone? So what 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 can I present that attracts their interest? And then the second thing is, what is the you know if I have one single key message uh, or an ask? Sometimes it's a message you want to convey. Sometimes it's a clear question. So let's say you want to get approval for a budget for for a certain milestone. Uh, so what is this one message or ask that you want to take home? And if you're clear about these two, uh, it will be much easier to make the right presentation. And, and so I will end just on a very like uh, specific uh, example, um, but just to highlight a bit, you know what what I mean here. Um, so in 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 aging research, uh, the let's say the the oldest uh, uh, working model of aging is that oxidative stress causes aging, and and this already is not so easy to to communicate to someone who's not not a biologist. So you know you can use and there are many ways to do this, but you can use very visual. Uh, you know, real life examples of, you know, what is oxidative stress? It's nothing else than rust that damages uh, a bucket. But of course, it doesn't do justice because it's a very simplified model. So you have to eventually adapt to the audience to get the key messages through because if oxidative stress was the only problem, we would all be happy with vitamin C, vitamin E. But the reality is that oxidative stress biology is very complicated where a basal rust level that is suppressed actually has a negative impact on, on lifespan just because um, ROS is an important signaling molecule. For example, during exercise, uh, there's more ROS produced, uh, which causes adaptations in, in your muscles that actually are good for your health. And only when ROS is not compensated, you get into oxidative damage that ultimately is detrimental for cells and, and reduces lifespan. And, and so, you know, these are just two examples where you, you try to work with like simple messages where you, you reach the audience and then you can go incrementally into, into more complexity based on the, on the background knowledge. So I end here. I just want to quickly highlight where we are. So we, uh, I work at this institute called the Nest Institute of Health Science, which has two locations. One here on the EPFL campus, uh, one is in uh, uh, Vergers les Blancs, uh, um, in the hills behind uh, Lausanne. Um, and for us, it's it's very really exciting to be on the EPFL campus. We have a PhD program. We are very close to to top labs in in uh, the the food uh, biotechnology and li and life science areas. Um, and uh, you know we we enjoy a lot the exchange with academia. So. Um, Thank you very much for, for listening and uh, I'm looking forward to, to any questions. 
Thank you, Philip, for a very, very interesting talk. And it's nice to see not just pharma, but also, you know, nutritional approaches to, to healthcare problems. Um, considering the time, I have to suggest that we, we quickly move on to the coffee break and um, we save any eventual questions for the session at five o'clock. I hope um, you can have some time to pass by quickly, Philip, because I'm sure there are some questions I read. There are a few questions from the audience. Um, but considering the time restraints, um, I will suggest that we quickly move on to the coffee break. But Philip, thank you very much. Uh, it was a very, very interesting talk. Do you have any thank closing you. remarks um, for the audience before we move on? No, I, I suggest, I mean, uh, that I will be there at five. So if you have questions, uh, you know, join perfect. the session, I'm happy to discuss. Perfect, perfect. So big warm thanks again and hope to see you this afternoon at five. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. So as mentioned, we'll now quickly have a five-minute break, uh, so we won't be too much delayed in our schedule. I hope to see you in a few minutes. See you soon.